All right, we are now live on YouTube. Oh, great. Well, hello to everyone out there on YouTube. So I will admit all of the folks in the waiting room. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, I have uh, just opened up the waiting room, and um, as I see more folks, maybe I'll uh, I'll I'll continue to add them for a while, and then we'll drop the waiting room. Uh, but I just want to uh, welcome everybody and, and introduce myself. I'm Barnes, and I'm from Tumble Home Books. And we're very excited to have today's uh, Tumbleosity with a, an author who was actually one of our very first authors uh, about a decade or so ago. And, um, and he did a book about, about weather, and it was a mystery book about weather. And he's come back and done another awesome book for us. And, uh, and we're very excited about it. It's called The Weather Detectives, for those of you who didn't get the 10 million emails we, we probably sent to you. Um, and uh, it's, it's very exciting to have uh, Michael Erb here um, speaking uh, with all of you because he himself is a weather scientist and professor. Uh, so he's very knowledgeable on this topic. And uh, we've, we've all, uh, uh, been, we've been very excited to, to see the responses out there from folks. We, we got a review from uh, Kirkus, which is a, a fantastic organization. Um, and we're uh, at this point, we're uh, just a, a week or two away from receiving inventory. So I, I also want to make sure that everybody's aware uh, for any of you who have ordered uh, a book or are planning on ordering a book, uh, we uh, due to a uh, all the shipping issues that happened this year uh, may or may not have been related to weather. Um, there has been a, a delay in, uh, in getting all the books to the warehouse. So, uh, so for any of you who order the book, uh, it should be probably uh, around two or so weeks uh, to be able to receive it. And, um, and, and in exchange for that, uh, for anybody who orders today with uh, the code WD25, uh, we are offering signed books uh, from uh, from Michael Erb, and uh, and any of you who order today, we're gonna uh, that order from our website, uh, we'll be getting a, a signed copy with the the uh, Tumblosity discount. So, uh, if anybody has any questions about this, uh, we'll, both of us will be on after the Tumblosity, and you could feel free to chat uh, either of us if you have any questions about uh, how to place an order. And during the uh, during the talk, I'll be sharing with you some links uh, uh, where uh, Michael's book is on our website, uh, as well as, as some other details. Uh, so with that, I think I, I'm, I'm messaged out. I don't think I have anything more to say other than we're going to um, keep it open. And, uh, and unless it gets really rowdy, I think we, we, we won't request people to necessarily mute. We, do, we encourage people to uh, interact with, with our author here. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll let Michael introduce himself and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Barnes. Uh, yeah, as Barnes said, my name is Michael Erb. I'm an assistant research professor at Northern Arizona University, um, and I study the climate. I study past climate of the past 12,000 years. Um, and yeah, I like to write books. And I should just mention, kind of appropriately, there is a thunderstorm going on uh, right in front of me. I hope it doesn't cause any technical difficulties. Um, I haven't lost power here before that often, but if I suddenly disappear, uh, you will know what happened. Let me go ahead and get this PowerPoint started. Um, so can you see my screen? It's just starting up. Yep. Uh, yep, looks good. Okay. You see the presentation? Yep. And can you see my mouse? Can see your mouse, yes. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. So today I want to talk about weather and mystery. 
Um, and as I said before, my name is Michael Erb. Um, and yeah, I'm an author and I'm a scientist. Uh, I currently work at Northern Arizona University. It's just south of the Grand Canyon. Um, and when you hear Arizona, you probably think hot and dry. Actually, we're up at 7,000 feet. Um, so due to the elevation here, uh, we have much more temperate conditions than say um, Phoenix. Um, however, you know, it does get up to, into the 90s still, so it can get warm. It can get very cold in the winter. Um, and I study climate of the past. I study climate of the past 12,000 years because exploring how climate has changed over the past, you know, 12,000 years or beyond, it gives us information about what the climate system is capable of and what interconnections there are in the climate system. And I'm not gonna talk about that uh, so much today. I wanna to mention too, that I also write books that combine my love of weather uh, and my love of mystery. And let's just get started. One thing I wanna say is weather is amazing. Um, I'm fascinated by the weather. Uh, this is a photo, I didn't take it. It's uh, taken by someone at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. Um, this is a supercell thunderstorm. Um, it's the most powerful sort of thunderstorm. It has this nice rotating structure. Uh, you can see a lot of rain coming down in the middle and also a lightning bolt. Um, and I, I think this is just gorgeous. Um, and it shows off some of the, you know, the features of what the climate system is capable of. Um, and weather is important too. You know, whether you realize it or not, you experience the weather every day. Weather isn't just storms or tornadoes or hurricanes. You know, if it's warm or it's cold or it's wet or it's dry, um, all of that is weather. And weather can determine what you do in a given day. Uh, you know, whether you go outside to the pool or on a bike ride or whether you stay home and read a book or do a board game, uh, that can be influenced by the weather. Um, climate is basically the sum of weather for a given place. Um, say, okay, my location, it gets fairly warm during the summer, it gets very cold during the winter, we have this many numbers of wet days. When you put all of that together, uh, that's climate. Um, one, one expression people like is, um, climate determines your wardrobe. Weather determines what you wear on a particular day. But yeah, uh, climate varies across the world. Temperature and precipitation, how much water people have, it affects how and where people live, especially water. People need water to survive. So very dry places like a desert, not many people live there. And unfortunately, um, severe weather can cause death and destruction. So, you know, it's beautiful. And it's important, um, but you also have to, you know, give it its due, uh, give it the appropriate amount of respect and caution. Uh, and I should say too, yeah, I wanna hear from you guys. If you have particular questions during this talk, feel free to post it in the chat or, you know, just speak up. Um, and at different times during the talk, I will have questions for you. So yeah, just, I wanna start out with some pictures. Um, I wanna say weather can be spectacular. So uh, down in the lower left, you can see this road. And imagine you're driving along that road and you look out your window and you see this massive circular storm. Um, that would just be amazing. Uh, it's, this is another one of those uh, super cell thunderstorms. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of rain down here at the bottom. It has this very nice, interesting shape to it. Um, here's some bolts of lightning. Um, this is in the Great Plains. I think this is just a really impressive uh, display of what nature can be capable of. Like I said, water is important and weather is important for bringing water uh, to different places. You know, places like India or Africa, a lot of them have wet and dry seasons. And they rely on the water coming during the monsoon season to bring them water for their crops. But sometimes if they get too much water, it can cause mudslides. So it's kind of a, a delicate act um, where you, you need the weather to survive, but you know, too intense of weather can cause problems. And weather can be dangerous. You know, here's a tornado. Um, here's another bolt of lightning. 
Um, an expression I like is, when thunder roars, go indoors. Um, basically means if, if you're out, especially if you're somewhere more exposed um, and you hear thunder, you know, find shelter, go inside or find somewhere safe to be, uh, preferably indoors um, so that you're not exposed to something like this, which can be quite deadly. And you know, here are big hailstones. These are big chunks of ice that accumulate ice up in the clouds. And eventually when they become too heavy, uh, they fall out of the sky. And you can imagine bits of ice that big or even larger can cause quite a lot of damage. There's a van that's been struck by a number of hailstones. And meteorologists are people who predict the weather. Um, and that's important because you wanna know, is it going to rain tomorrow? Is it going to be hot next week? That sort of thing. Um, so they use things like uh, radar. This is an old Doppler radar station. They use things like satellites. or also just local um, thermometers and barometers and radio sons, which are balloons that carry uh, instruments up into the sky. So you can get a, a look at what it's like higher in the atmosphere. But yeah, so this talk is interactive and I do wanna hear from you all. Um, and when you see this symbol, I wanna hear from you. Um, so let's, let's give this a try. I have a poll here. Uh, let me figure out how to do this. You want me to do um, Okay. So yeah, we have a poll. It should be on your screen now. Um, what is your favorite season? Winter, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, and of course, in the tropics, if you live in the tropics, seasons are a little different there, but um, a lot of places, these are our normal seasons. Uh, so I'd like to hear, I give a, another minute or so. Uh, looks like 14 people, 15, have answered so far. Um, and one thing I'll say as we're waiting is, I like variety. You know, I'm just glad we have seasons. Cold temperatures in winter, warm temperatures in summer, um, get moderate conditions in fall and spring, the flowers coming out in spring and the leaves changing color in fall. It's all just wonderful. Okay, so we have most of you. Um, so it looks like summer is the winner here. Um, summer has 33% of people. Uh, so a third of you say summer is your favorite. Uh, winter looks like it came in second place, uh, spring in third and fall in fourth. Uh, so that's cool, that's a good distribution too. Um, and different seasons have been my favorite at different times of my life. I used to like fall the most, I think I like spring the most now. Um, and of course, summer and winter are also nice. They have their, their benefits as well. This probably depends a little bit on where you live on how harsh winter or summer is where you live. Okay, so let's keep going. One of my experiences with weather was Hurricane Sandy. Um, Hurricane Sandy happened back in 2012, so about nine, what's that? I think that was an echo. Oh, sorry. Yeah, around nine years ago in 2012, we had Hurricane Sandy. Uh, here's the track, it developed down here in the Caribbean, and we're, we'll talk more about the Caribbean later. It kind of traveled northward um, and made landfall on mainland US, uh, right around here in New Jersey. And this is where I lived at the time, New Brunswick, New Jersey. So I got to deal with the remnants of Hurricane Sandy that year. And here's a picture I took. This is a view from my apartment. Um, we got lots of rain during the day. and. The whole region, you know, several states got lots of rain that day. And just to point out a couple features of this photo, you can see a, a river. This is the Raritan River in the background. Um, you can see the highway that's closer. And a whole lot of area got a lot of rain that day. And a lot of that rain all filtered down into the Raritan River and caused the river to rise. And once it rose enough, the water actually spilled over this bit of green and started filling up this section of highway. Um, and, and just take a look, you know, you have um, a bridge here and kind of a raised section of highway there. 
you know, the power went out at my place. Um, I, I was watching out the window to see the, the flooding of the highway. A lot of cars would come down the highway and they would see the water there and they would do the right thing, which was to get off the highway, you know, not to drive through the water, to find a different route. Of course, a couple of cars did go forward. And when the water was shallow, um, they actually did manage to make it through. That's a bad decision, don't do that. But as the water continued to rise, at least one car got stuck. And so this is basically the same angle. You now you can see the bridge here. You can see the raised section there. This is the highway. This is water. It's a little hard to see, but you can see the roof of a car right there. We have several feet of water in the highway right now. There's still, you know, one or more people inside that car um, and they're stuck. You know, the car is, the, the water is basically up to the windows. Um, a fire truck comes, other uh, emergency personnel come, um, and they basically have to rescue this person from the car. Uh, they get a guy, they strap a harness on him. It's attached to a rope. Um, so this emergency personnel, he can wade out into the water and other people can, you know, hold the rope or the rope is secured to something and he can go out to this car and rescue uh, the people inside. Um, and luckily he did. I don't think anybody was hurt during this. But here's a good expression. Turn around, don't drown. Basically, whether you're on foot or whether you're in your car, if you come to flood water, um, don't go through it. You know, even six inches can be deceptively powerful. Um, it can sweep you off your feet uh, or it can sweep away your car. So it's, you know, whenever you can avoid it, do not go through standing water. And yeah, this is another picture that night. Um, this is not weather. This is something related to the electrical system in the city. It was just a brief flash that I just happened to catch on camera. Um, it was some part of the electrical system going dark. You can see the, the city, uh, the big buildings over here, mostly dark already. You should be able to see apartment buildings down here and they're all dark as well. So basically the entire city and a lot of New Jersey lost power. The next day, um, the, the storm had cleared. There wasn't any wind or precipitation anymore. So I went on, out on a walk. Um, you know, you can see a fallen tree here. You can see a, a bench fallen over, another fallen tree. It was quite interesting to see all these leaves and all this destruction that the storm had, had brought. Um, this is the next night. The city is still dark. You ought to see, be able to see lots of lights in these windows and it's all dark. Um, and actually, my apartment, we lost power for five days. And other parts of the state, especially the coast, lost power for a lot longer than that. And this hurricane came through in late, Dece uh, late October. So we actually delayed Halloween by a week. You know, at my apartment building, you don't want kids trick-or-treating if uh, the apartment building is completely dark. So we said, you know, okay, we'll just delay Halloween by a week. So, okay, that's one of my experiences with weather. Um, and I like weather and I like mysteries like Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie books. So I combined those two and I wrote weather themed mysteries. And here are my two books. This is the first one, uh, Kelvin McLeod and the Seaside Storm. Um, the characters travel to the New Jersey coast to investigate uh, the case of a, a guy who apparently died in a hailstorm, but it turns out to be much more. Um, this is the new one, The Weather Detectives. It takes place in the Caribbean on a ship. Um, and it even has a hurricane. You know, I've been talking about Hurricane Sandy. This one features, features a hurricane in the Caribbean. So I want you to tell you a little bit about this book. So here are the two main characters. Uh, this is Henry and Rachel. Um, and I should say too, that Henry's uncle, Kelvin McLeod is a detective. So he investigates weather related mysteries. Um, and Henry and Rachel, they help with the cases. So here's a quote from the book about Henry. Henry wasn't a detective himself, not officially anyway, but his uncle wouldn't solve half their cases without him, he suspected. So they were basically partners. And here's a quote about Rachel. An adventurous streak ran through Rachel Willoughby. She loved to draw, 
painted in vivid watercolor, explored passionately, and approached life with a vigor that made even mundane things seem exciting. And towards the beginning of this book, Henry is in his apartment in New York, and he's watching a thunderstorm from his window. And I want to pose a question to you all. Say you're looking out at a thunderstorm, and you can see the lightning, and you can hear the thunder. How do you figure out the distance to lightning? And anybody who wants can speak up. Orange, please. It says, how do you figure out the distance to lightning? You know? Okay. Has mommy, has mommy and daddy ever told you about counting? Count one, two. And this one's saving. But we'll get you some orange juice and some cherries. Okay, I see a comment from Stacy Mueller uh, in the chat. It says, count after the thunder. And that is correct. Um, and let's just, um, let me pose a more specific question. So uh, say you see a bolt of lightning and 10 seconds later, you hear thunder. How far away is the lightning? So is it one mile, two miles, three miles, or four miles? Let me, uh, I'll start a poll. So let me, let me see what you think. And obviously I haven't told you how to do this yet. So I don't really expect you to know the answer, although you might. Okay, so most people have said either one mile or two miles. Actually, 50% of people said one mile. Um, the actual answer is two miles away. Um, like I said, I didn't, I didn't really tell you how to do this yet. So let's, let's figure this out. Um, so yeah, the lightning is two miles away. So once you see a bolt of lightning, start counting seconds until you hear the thunder. For every five seconds, the lightning is one mile away. And that's because, you know, you see the lightning bolt, and it's a big flash of light, and light is absurdly fast. So basically, as soon as the lightning happens, you see it. Um, whereas sound is a lot slower. Sound takes about five seconds to travel a mile. So if you count and you see how many seconds pass, you can say how far away it is. Um, so it's five seconds to one mile, 10 seconds is two miles. If it were something like eight seconds, you would say, okay, that's more than five and less than 10. It's about a mile and a half away, a little bit more than that. Um, and if you see the lightning bolt too, you can see what direction it is. So if you know the direction to the lightning and how far away it is, you could conceivably get out a map and you know estimate what that lightning struck. Okay, so yeah, in New York, Henry and his uncle re receive a letter during this thunderstorm. Here is this letter. It says, Detective McLeod, urgent. Of course, I open it up. Here's the beginning of the letter. Ahoy, Mr. McLeod. It's come to my attention that you've been inquiring about our ship. You've called here many times, I've told. No doubt you've heard the stories that sinister accidents plague us on nearly every voyage. And yeah, Kelvin McLeod is a detective, and he did hear about this ship that had strange things happening on it down in the Caribbean. Uh, and he had been trying to look into it, and nobody would give him information. But finally, somebody, some anonymous person, reaches out to him with a letter, and they actually hire him for the case. They say, I don't want to say who I am, but I will pay you money if you can figure out what is happening on this ship. And so this is the case. Strange incidents are plaguing a big ship in the Caribbean. It's a big sailing ship. Um, so Henry, Rachel, and Kelvin go on adventure in the Caribbean. They meet a secretive sea captain who appears to have some sort of secrets. They see strange things on the ship. They encounter wild weather. 
uh, including that hurricane that I mentioned before. And they investigate a mystery on tropical Caribbean waters. And I don't want to give away too much about the plot, um, but if that has intrigued you, I, I suggest you can check out the book. Um, and throughout the book, Henry and Rachel also learn about science, weather, and history. Um, I want to talk about some of these historical stories, which I think are just fascinating, weather-related stories. So historical story number one, predicting the weather with leeches. I have a question mark there, because I'm not entirely sure if this ever really worked. But in the 1800s, a man named George Merriweather invented a device to hopefully predict the weather with leeches. He called this device the Tempest Prognosticator. This is a real thing. This really happened. Um, and here is a drawing uh, from his book. I believe it's from his book to show what this device looked like. And let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit on the bottom. And it has these glass jars. And on each of them, there's like a little wire that heads up to the top. And inside each jar, there are leeches. Uh, and it's a particular type of leech. And the idea is that when they notice, the, these leeches can uh, presumably notice low pressure. And low pressure often comes, uh, often brings storms. So the idea is the leeches notice the low pressure. The low pressure is an indicator of a approaching storm. And when the leeches notice low pressure, they're supposed to wriggle about and climb up to the top of their jars. They become more active and they dislodge a little wire. And the little wire is attached to uh, a bell at the top. And so when the leeches crawl up the bottle, it rings the bell. And the idea is that when uh, the bell rings several times, a storm is on the way. And here's a quote from my book about this. The key component of Dr. Merriweather's new device was something unusual, something alive, leeches. Yes, you read that correctly. This new device, the Tempest Prognosticator, used living leeches. Uh, and do you think this device caught on or not? I'm going to say what you're all thinking, uh, that it did not catch on uh, because they, they actually already had barometers at that point, which did the same job and did it much more easily. Um, and you didn't need to feed them. So the Tempest Prognosticator did not become popular. Barometers worked better. We still use barometers today. They come in different forms. Uh, they use some sort of um, either cell or maybe mercury um, to detect changes in the pressure. They do work better than Tempest prognosticators. Tempest prognosticators, um, I'm not sure if they ever really worked. They're, they're differing accounts um, of whether they worked or not, but they didn't become popular. Dr. Merriweather or George Merriweather you know, tried to get different lighthouses to adopt the Tempest prognosticator to say, oh, you know, okay, when the storm comes, you'll know it. Um, but maybe one of the reasons they didn't be unpopular is that you actually need to feed leeches. Uh, and having a weather device you need to feed is probably not the most um, convenient thing. So historical story number two is journey to the South Pole. I think the South Pole and Antarctica in general is a fascinating place. It's the huge continent um, at the south part of the earth. Um, it's covered in ice. It's a very cold place. It's kind of hard to get to. Um, there are scientists that do research there, but in general, not people don't really live there per se. So here's a quote from my book. Above all else, weather rules Antarctica. On average, of all the continents, it is the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. It is bigger than either Europe or Australia. In the worst conditions, taking a glove off for a few minutes can freeze the very water in your skin. 
leaving you with painful frostbite. Oh, and just to return to uh, our last story about the Tempest Prognosticator, somebody asked, why would someone invent Tempest Prognosticator when barometers were already a thing? That's a good question, especially since I said barometers work better um, and they're probably cheaper to make um, and they're certainly more convenient. You know, I think Mr. Merriweather, he just wanted to try to improve things, you know. You know, they did already have barometers. Barometers already worked well, but of course, you know, inventors, they wanna try something else. I say, okay, maybe if I uh, do this a different way, I can come up with a device that works better. Um, so it's, it's a noble goal, um, but yeah, it, it turned out to be something that, um, People didn't really want. Yeah, and especially as you say, barometers already existed and worked better. Yeah, Antarctica. I, I think Antarctica is fascinating. I would love to go there sometime. You know, as it says here, it's the windiest, it's the coldest, and it's the highest average elevation of any of our continents. It's bigger than Europe or Australia. Um, and I have another poll question for you. What was the coldest temperature measured in Antarctica? So was it negative 72 Fahrenheit, negative 96, negative 115, or negative 128? Let me get this poll active. Okay, here we go. You should have the poll in front of you. Answers are coming in. And like I said before, I don't necessarily expect you to know this, um, but it is a fun fact. I, I thought I would see what you, what, what's your intuition? I don't know if you could hear that. There was just a big bit of thunder right outside. Okay, so we have most of you now. Uh, and the top answer is negative 128 uh, with 44% of people guessing that. Um, and then the second place was negative 115 and then negative 96 and then negative 72. Um, and you guys are right. The correct answer is negative 128. Um, you wanna be more precise? Uh, it's negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit in Vostok, Antarctica. Um, and that's a place that's more in the interior of Antarctica. Um, and I, I say it's the coldest recorded temperature. It might get colder in different places, um, but you know, people aren't everywhere in Antarctica. So this is just the coldest that's been measured. And let's just give you an idea of how cold that really is. So imagine temp a temperature scale. Um, and here I've put, I've put two degrees on it. Um, there's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There's nothing all that special about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is just, a, it's, a, it's a very hot temperature. If you went outside and it was 100, degree, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you would say, wow, this is hot. Um, and you might decide to go back inside. Uh, another temperature here is negative, uh, is positive 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is where water freezes. Um, that's a fairly cold temperature. You know, if you go outside in 32 degrees, you want your coat, maybe some winter gear. If it drops much below that, maybe you'll get some snow. Um, maybe lakes will start to freeze. Um, so these are just two points of reference. But to get down to negative 128.6, we need to extend the scale quite a lot. So here we are up here. You can imagine the difference between these two temperatures is a lot of difference. And now here's negative 128.6. And if, the, if this is the difference between a very hot day and a fairly cold day, just imagine how much colder this is. You go all the way down to negative 128.6. And so Antarctica is a place that you have to respect the weather. Uh, you have to bring the right gear. Um, you can't make silly mistakes because it can cause uh, uh, accidents. It can cause death. Uh, people have died there. 
Um, and not just the temperature, but uh, there's a lot of wind, blizzards can pop up. There are actually um, crevasses in the ice itself, which are a little deceptive. You know, you can be walking along and not realize that there's a big, uh, big crevasse in the ice and people have fallen into these things and it, it's, it's not a good situation. So in 1911, around 100 years ago, a little over, there was a race to the South Pole. And it wasn't like a normal race. It wasn't like a starting line and somebody says go and people start off. It was just that there were two teams that both wanted to be the first people ever to reach the South Pole. The South Pole is quite um, distant from the ocean. It's difficult to get there. They didn't have planes. They could just fly over there. Um, but they had to start at the coast and then using sleds and either dogs or one of the groups used ponies. Uh, they had to try to make it there. And you only had a set amount of time too because you want to start off once the seasons start to get warmer and then you have the summer season and you want to be back to your ship by the time uh, fall is you know, bringing in those colder temperatures. Because if you're stuck in Antarctica, uh, in the middle of Antarctica in the fall and in the winter, um, it's not going to be a good thing. So the two groups, one was Norwegian, one was English. Um, the, the Norwegian group won. They made it there first. This is Roald Amundsen. He led the expe expedition. Their group made it there first in December of 1911. And, and you might see December, you know, oh, I just said that you don't want to be in Antarctica in the winter. But you have to remember that seasons in Southern Hemisphere are opposite. Um, so December is actually the summer in Antarctica. So this was a fine time to be there. The other group, the British group, it's actually a bit of a sad story. Um, they took a bit longer to get there. Uh, they did make it to the South Pole. Uh, as they were trying to make their way back, uh, it started getting cold. Um, one interesting thing is that, you know, imagine you're skiing and you, you have your skis on and it, you have a nice glide over the surface. Uh, one interesting thing is that that gliding motion, that nice sweeping over the snow when you're on skis, it only really works if it's warm enough. Uh, and I mean, you have, it can be pretty cold, but if it gets way too cold, that no longer works. Um, the, the, the skis no longer glide over the snow. Instead, the snow's not melting at all due to the pressure. It becomes like sandpaper. So imagine trying to ski on sandpaper. And that's what happened to the British group is they're trying to make it back and it's difficult to ski. Um, I think all their ponies had died by that point and they, they never actually made it out of Antarctica. So it's a bit of a sad story. Um, but Roald Amundsen and his four companions, they made it there, they had sleds uh, and they had dogs. And here's a drawing of one of Roald Amundsen's camps. Uh, this is not the South Pole, but it's one of the glaciers. You can see lots of ice. Uh, you can see some of their skis, um, different bits of gear. Uh, they did bring along a lot of dogs who were with them, at least at first. Um, and yeah, Antarctica is a, a kind of wild place. And the South Pole can drop below negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. And as I said, thankfully, Roald Amundsen wasn't there in the winter. He, he made it back out before it got too cold. And he wrote a book about his, um, his expedition. It's called the South Pole. Uh, you can go find it, it's free. Um, it's a little bit dry, uh, but here is a quote from him. This is translated from the Norwegian. And this is his experience when he reached the South Pole. Um, at three in the afternoon, a simultaneous halt rang out from the drivers. They'd carefully examined their sledge meters and they all showed the full distance, our pole by reckoning. The goal was reached, the journey ended. I cannot say, though I know it would sound much more effective that the object of my life was attained. That would be romancing rather too barefacedly. And he says this because he's, a, he's an explorer. He dreams, of, he dreams of reaching these remote places. He was also the first person who made it all the way through the Northwest Passage, sailing through those, those icy islands of Northern Canada. But he was Norwegian. He, he always dreamed as a kid of going to the North Pole, to being the first person there. 
But actually, two Americans both claim to reach the North Pole first. Um, and it's unclear. Um, one of them definitely didn't make it. Um, history suggests that maybe the other group didn't make it either. So potentially the North Pole was still not reached. Um, but he decided anyway, he would set out for a different goal. He would go to the South Pole, even though he spent his youth dreaming about the North Pole. So he goes on. I had better be honest and admit straight out that I've never known any man to be placed in such a diametrically opposite position to the goal of his desires as I was at that moment. The regions around the North Pole, well, yes, the North Pole itself, had attracted me from childhood, and here I was at the South Pole, and anything more topsy-turvy be imagined. So like I said, I, I think Antarctica is an amazing place, and I'd love to go there someday. Um, I have not been there yet. But you don't need to go all the way to Antarctica to find weather. It is right outside. And one fun thing, if it's kind of a nice day with little fluffy clouds, uh, one thing that's fun to do is to try to find shapes in the clouds. So often, uh, clouds can look like animals, other sorts of shapes, and much more. So I want to hear from you all. Um, these, are, these are pictures that I took myself. Um, they weren't very hard to find. This was just uh, over the course of two days, I found some clouds. Um, yeah, either in chat or just say, what do you think this looks like? There's no right answer. You know, you can see whatever you want in a cloud. But what do you think it looks like? A duck. A duck, yes. It definitely looks like a duck. You know, maybe you have kind of a head, you have a little eye here, you have a bill, maybe a wing, and kind of a body and tail. Yeah, somebody in the chat says a rubber ducky. Ooh, somebody in the chat says a dragon. Yeah, I could see that too. You know, a big wing. Uh, this could maybe be some sort of fire breath or the dragon's snout. Uh, yeah, I see a falcon, um, a hummingbird. People are saying in the chat. Uh, somebody else says duck. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of birds or you know mythical flying uh, creatures. So yeah, uh, my first thought was, yeah, some sort of bird. Okay, so, you know, here, here's another one. Maybe this is a little harder. Um, what do people see here? A dragon. Oh, a dragon. Yeah, maybe. Do you think, you think this is the mouth? Looks like a, a piece of bunny fur. A piece of what? Bunny fur. Rabbit oh, fur. fur. Oh, yeah. Definitely could be. I see in the chat, somebody says a baby. Uh, maybe this is the big baby head. Uh, somebody says a dog or a wolf. I see another vote for dog with the head on the left. Yeah, this could definitely be a dog head. Maybe, maybe you have a little ear here and a little ear here and kind of a snout out this way. Um, a turtle. I see an, a turtle. Maybe this is the mouth. Yeah, it could be eating, eating some little uh, little scraps out here. Somebody else says a baby or a hand reaching out. Yeah, I could definitely see a hand reaching out um, with fingers going this way. So I thought, my first thought was an octopus. Um, you know, with a big octopus head over this way and tentacles going out this way. And there's no right answer. All of us are right. Um, I just think this is what I, uh, it looks like. And perhaps that's because I like octopuses. Maybe I see it uh, because that's what I want to see. Okay, one more. What does this one look like? A person falling from the sky. Oh yeah, definitely. So maybe the head over here and the body going this way. Uh, yeah, and an arm reaching out. That could definitely be a person. Somebody in the chat says a dove. Yeah, I could definitely see a dove there. Again, probably the head over this way, maybe some wings going up. Anything else? The, the bottom part looks like a dinosaur. Oh yeah, this part down here? Like a dog face. Oh yeah. Face. Yeah, it's, it's fun to see things like dinosaurs in the clouds. I love dinosaurs. 
Um, okay, somebody else said a giant falling, and somebody agrees that they it's a giant. And yeah, like the person before, you know, um, maybe the head over here and the, the body stretching out this way. Somebody skydiving. Yeah, sure. Somebody says Daffy Duck. Oh yeah, maybe uh, maybe the bill going this way and the, the lower bit over here. So this is something fun you can do kind of whenever there are clouds in the sky. These sort of fluffy cumulus clouds work the best for it um, because they do come in different shapes and they actually change pretty quickly. You know, pretty quickly within a few minutes after I took each of these photos, the clouds started looking like something else. Um, so, you know, if you want, you can sit outside and look at these clouds drifting by and see what you think they look like. And clouds, clouds are interesting. They're a great part of our weather system. Um, clouds are made out of water. They're made out of little droplets of water or ice that are suspended up in the air by uh, updrafts, which keep them from falling down to the ground. Um, and you know, when they, when they grow big, you can get storms, you can get rain or snow if it's cold enough, or freezing rain or sleet or hail. So they're important parts of the climate system. So you can think about that too when you're looking at shapes in the clouds. And they also keep us cool when clouds come across the sun. So I thought this one might look like a ship. Um, and again, maybe because it's, I, I want to see a ship, but you know, here can be maybe the front of the ship right here and of the hull here and a sail going up and maybe the mast and some flags up top. Maybe this is a little wave uh, underneath the ship. But like I said, there's no right answer. But if you want to see more stuff like this, uh, I made this website. It's weatherdetectives.org. Um, it has a variety of activities and photos and other sorts of weather history. Um, here's some of the, the activities. Uh, build a barometer. Uh, learn about snowflake photography. Learn about distance to lightning. Um, that's like what we did before. And I have a lot more cloud photos. Um, so if you thought this was fun, you can go look at some of the other pictures I have on this website and see what you think they look like. And now just to kind of wrap up, let's do a few more interesting facts about weather. So did you know lightning can heat the air to uh, 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, so that's hotter than the surface of the sun. It's quite hot, but it's just kind of momentary. If it strikes sand, if it strikes sand, it can actually melt the sand into this hollow glass tube called a fulgurite. And you can see one here that's kind of been, uh, maybe the sand has been cleared away a little bit, so it's um, visible. But the lightning bolt has melted this sand into a type of glass. So here's the second thing. Did you know if it's extremely hot outside, it's more difficult for planes to take off? So, you know, they've canceled flights before because it's too hot. And that's because when it's really hot outside, um, the, air, the air actually expands a little bit. And when the air expands, it means that there's, in any given space, there's a little bit less air. And planes need a lot of air under their wings uh, to take off. And if there's not quite enough air, they say, okay, this is a little bit more dangerous now. Maybe we should cancel this flight. Um, oh, and I have a question about lightning. It says, does lightning go up from the ground or from the clouds down? Um, and that's a great question. And it's actually a little bit complicated um, because you, know, you can uh, watch slow motion of lightning and it, it's really cool um, to watch. But yeah, it's not quite clear. Is it coming down or is it going up? And the reason that it's not too clear is because it kind of goes both ways. Um, so in a, in a normal, uh, cloud to ground lightning bolt, which is when a, a lightning bolt comes out of cloud and hits the ground. Um, basically, there, it's a little technical, but there's negatives at the bottom of the cloud and it, it creates an area of positive charge on the ground itself. So it starts from the cloud um, that this, uh, this thing called a stepped leader basically, you know, these kind of tendrils of charge that are coming down from the cloud. And it's kind of, it's seeking out the best path to the ground. Once it gets close to the ground, some of that positive charge at the ground comes up from the ground and meets it. 
And when the negative charge from the cloud and the positive charge from the ground, when they meet up, that's what you see as the main bright stroke. So you can see that initial step leader. Uh, you can see it, especially in a, in a slow-mo video, you can see it coming down from the cloud. But the main bolt of lightning, the brightest bit, actually comes up from the ground as that positive charge is rushing up into the cloud. So that's a great question. So yeah, hot temperatures make it difficult for planes to come out. Uh, the place with the most lightning in the world is Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela. And there it is pointed out on the map. Lightning happens there on hundreds of nights a year. And some people call it the everlasting storm. Uh, and you can see videos of this too, and it, it, looks, it looks really neat. But of course, lightning can be dangerous, so you have to worry about it. And here's a neat story about Lake Maracaibo. Um, a long time ago, there was this guy named Francis Drake and he wanted to uh, attack the city of Maracaibo, which is on the shore of Lake Maracaibo. So he thought, I'll bring my fleet in, and in the middle of the night, we'll sail to this city under the cover of darkness, and we'll do a surprise attack against this city. But what he didn't consider is that there's so much lightning on this lake, and actually the lightning illuminated his ships and so the people of the city said, oh, there's a big fleet of ships sailing towards us. We better get ready. And actually, it completely foiled uh, his attack because he no longer had the element of surprise uh, and he didn't end up attacking the city. And one last one. Actually, this relates to a question from earlier. Uh, somebody had asked, uh, what is the largest um, hailstone that's been recovered? And here it is. Um, this hailstone was eight inches across. That's larger than a grapefruit. You can imagine a grapefruit is quite large. And this is even bigger. Um, and you can imagine that falling from the sky. And if that hurt, if that hit a person or livestock, that could do quite a lot of damage. And this is actually a little smaller than it was because it melted a little bit before they could measure it. So originally it was even a little bit bigger than this. How big so did that, you say? This is eight inches across. So bigger than grapefruit. Okay, so that's kind of all I had today. Um, I just wanted to mention again, I've written two books. The new one, The Weather Detectives, is out today. Um, as Barnes said earlier, if you order it today um, on the Tumblr Home website, um, you can get a discount with the code WD25. Um, and if you order today, I'll actually, I'll, I'll sign a label so it'll have my signature inside. And yeah, that's all I had for today. So uh, thanks for joining me. And does anybody have any more questions or comments? What's the quote again? Uh, the book, it's uh, called the, the Weather Detectives. The code is WD25. And I, I just, I put that in the chat for everybody to see, WD25. Thank you again, Mr. Erb, for hosting this. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I see, uh, yeah, you just mentioned, uh, if you Google Lake Maracaibo lightning, you can find videos. Those are, yeah, thousands of videos. Those are crazy. Yeah, uh, that's a really neat place. Any other questions or comments? Looks like a, a lot of people are just saying thank you. Everybody really appreciated today's presentation, Michael. So thank you. Really? Was, thanks from, uh, from Tumble Home. This was, was really awesome. Um, and for those of you uh, still on, uh, Michael has also done a, a really cool video trailer for his book. So for those of you who, uh, who are um, not sure, if you're not completely sold on the book, check out that trailer. It's on the Tumble Home YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to YouTube and type in Tumble Home Books and uh, click on our, our channel or, or get to it through our website, tumblehomebooks.org, and, and uh, check out uh, Michael's, Michael's awesome trailer. Lots of lightning all around him. Yeah.
And also, if you go to this weatherdetectives.org site, I have weather activities and photos. I also have the first chapter of the book. Um, if you click the book section, uh, you can go find that. So you can read the first chapter just completely for free and see if you like it. Great, thank you everybody for showing up today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, uh, and if you go back to our uh, uh, front of our website and check out uh, our tumbleosities, there's a, a section under services on our, uh, uh, the tabs on our website. And uh, you could see what other workshops we have coming up soon. And, uh, and please be sure to sign up early and sign up often. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Oh, uh, just you. one more thing. Somebody mm -hmm. in the chat uh, asked, what's the age range for the group? Um, well, I think probably nine to 14 year olds, um, sure. say yep. in middle school. However, I do think it's fun for all ages. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to check it out. Great. Again, thank you everybody for, for uh, joining our Tumblosity today and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>